Hey guys, welcome to Crosswalk Week 12. We're super excited that you could be here with us today. Even if you weren't able to zoom in with us online, we're glad that you're choosing to be a part of the Rock community by watching this teaching um, online. Also, just want to remind you that in addition to the teaching video, our worship video will also be online on IGTV and YouTube following uh, the close of the service. So make sure that you guys jump on and check that out. Also wanted to say welcome to week 12. You guys have made it through an incredibly difficult semester full of social distancing, virtual classes, a lot of fear, a lot of chaos, but you guys have been doing great. We just want to encourage you guys as things are wrapping up that you guys finish the race strong, um, you know, hang in there, study hard, apply yourself to the last couple weeks and uh, just be able to walk into the break between the semesters ready to relax and spend some time with your family. So with that in mind, we actually have a couple announcements that we wanted to share with you. First of all being this, um, that in addition to our teaching and worship videos that you can find on YouTube and Instagram, each week the Rock Community puts out a Spotify worship playlist. Two weeks ago, Rachel put together the list. Uh, last week it was Charlotte, but it's just a way that we can all be worshiping together and as a community and kind of one of the ways that we can kind of stay connected and on the same page during a really difficult time when the whole community can't be together. So make sure that you guys are checking those out. Also, just a reminder, if you would want to put one of these together, we would love to have you share some of your favorite songs with us to encourage us as we get through our week as well. So if you'd like to do that, shoot me or Charlotte a message and let us know that you'd like to do that and we will make sure that we share that link with the rest of the community. In addition, we've started a brand new series called Five Minute Friday Devotions. Um, Noelle kind of messed up everything last week, just kidding. Um, she went just a little bit over that, but our, our heart for this is just to share a passage of scripture with you, um, a few thoughts and a few questions that will encourage you as you head into the weekend. Uh, this week, our very own James Wallace is going to be doing the Five Minute Friday devotion for us. However, again, if you would like to participate in that, if you would like to share some thoughts on maybe your favorite scripture or a scripture that is meaningful to you, message Charlotte or I, we would love to have you be a part of that as well. So don't forget that is happening. Also, just a quick reminder as we talk about heading into the end of the semester, two weeks from now, that's Thanksgiving week, week 14, Rock will have no normal services happening that week. Um, even if you're here Monday or Tuesday to look for stuff to do, message us. We'd love to still get together with you, maybe share a cup of coffee, but our Bible studies, crosswalk, things like that are canceled so that way you guys can go home and enjoy some well-needed R&R and some time with your family. So uh, those are the announcements that we have for you this week, and uh, we look forward to being with you guys again in person, hopefully really, really soon. Thanks. All right, so tonight we're kicking off a brand new teaching series entitled Holy Clapback. Uh, my original design and thought for this series was actually to call it Holy Clapback Batman uh, as a reference to the old Adam West Batman and Robin uh, conversations went back and forth, but I thought that was too much of a mouthful, so we shortened it down to just Holy Clapback. And uh, so over the course of the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at the way that Jesus clapped back at some of the religious leaders of the day and not only you know taking some I guess humor from that but also being a little introspective uh, for ourselves to make sure that if Jesus was here today would he have the same words to say to us so um, we're gonna be going through this for the next three weeks looking at the ways that Jesus confronts um, some of the things that were wrong with the religious leaders of the day and so uh, this week we're actually going to be talking about hip hop, your best stop. I know, I'm sorry, it's a dad joke. I can't help myself, guys. It just happens when you age. But uh, we're gonna be talking specifically about the hypocrisy of the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And so before we get into that, though, I guess maybe there are a couple of you out there that don't know what a clapback is yet. So let's talk about that. What is a clap back and so I actually went online and found this definition and I felt like it was appropriate it says this um, a clap back is not to be confused with any garden style dist uh, a clap back is is deemed by most as a targeted often viciously acute comeback intended to place someone in much needed check the goal of the clap back is to shut it down now 
Um, some of you guys have been on the receiving end of a clap back. Uh, maybe it was your parents who got on you and you were feeling a little too entitled when you were younger and they reminded you whose house that you were living in. Um, some of you guys were on the sending end of a clap back and you know how bad that burn felt you know, to that other person when you saw it come across their face. But um, you know, some of us still are kind of understanding what, I still don't understand Dodger, what is a clap back, how is it different than just a regular cut down. So I've got this little example, you guys will see it here on the screen. Um, and this is one that I actually found on Christian memes, I thought it was pretty good. And maybe this is even something that you guys have heard walking into a church. I know like I heard this a lot when I was younger. So um, a church Karen walks up to you and says, I can't believe you wore those jeans to church with so many holes in them. And you respond back with, Karen, my jeans have less holes in them than your theology. Ooh, wicked clap back there. And so, you know, as we, we talk about this idea of a holy clap back, I want to be really clear about a couple things. One is that, you know, we're, especially as it, re, as it relates to Jesus, you know, Jesus never, you know, clapped back just for the sake of putting other people down. So there are three specific characteristics when we say holy clap back, even in the way that Jesus was applying them to the religious leaders of the day, that I think that we need to take note of. First is that Jesus never... Uh, aimed these words at the hurting, the broken, or the marginalized of society. And sadly, that's what a lot of us do today. Because why? They're, it's really easy targets, really easy picking. It's low-hanging fruit. Um, it's easy to clap back at people who are struggling. Easy to, to clap back at people who have some obvious flaws. But be really clear here that Jesus never did this even with every opportunity that he was given and, and obviously being the son of God nobody had the right more than Jesus to ever clap back at, at people but Jesus never used his position um, to clap back at people who were hurting or marginalized by society so I think that's important that when we we talk about this that not only we recognize that but that we are careful that we do not do the same to other people and the second thing that I want us to see is this that Jesus actually reserved his harshest words for those who chose to make targets of the former group of people we were just talking about. So for the people that chose to make targets out of the hurting, the marginalized, and the broken in society, Jesus clapped back at them almost you know, solely just at them. And so we need to be really, really careful because when we do the same, when we clap back at people who are hurting, broken, and marginalized, then we're putting ourselves in the same position, probably to hear some of the same reprimands that Jesus shared with the, uh, the religious leaders of the day. So let's be careful that we don't clap back at people who are hurting um, in our day. And the third thing that I want to see is this, that Jesus' words were never meant to elevate himself or to tear others down. And, and so let's just pause there for a second and, and understand that a lot of times we clap back at people. We clap back because that's what we're trying to do. We're either trying to tear them back down or we're trying to elevate ourselves. And, and we do this a lot. Guys, sometimes, I'll pick on us for a second, we are vicious with one another. A lot of times that we, we find out something that, that another guy is self-conscious about or uh, that they're struggling with, and sometimes we use that against them and clap back at them when they're least expecting it. And we've gotta be really, really careful as Christians, especially with our brothers in Christ um, and sisters in Christ, obviously, that we don't, um, tear each other down, and that we don't use the clap back to elevate ourselves above someone else to make us look or appear better than we actually are. So let's be careful of that. Um, but so Jesus never used these words to elevate himself or to tear others down, but instead to reveal a blind spot um, in an issue in the lives of people who were convinced of their own righteousness. So as we talk about this today, um, you know, what I want us to do is, is, is we think about this idea of a holy clapback. Um, I want us to think about what our response to be, is to be. When we see Jesus, you know, deal out this harsh clapback to the Pharisees and religious leaders of the day, how should that impact us? You know, as we read it, where are we just going to go, oh, sick of Jesus, good job. Or are we going to be a little self-reflective and consider the ways that perhaps maybe those words might also apply to ourselves? Maybe we need to check ourselves and make sure that Jesus couldn't be saying the exact same things to, to, um, 
to us. And so, like I've mentioned before in a, in a couple recent sermons, you know, a lot of times when we talk about um, heroes of the Bible, we think about David and Goliath, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, Moses, and, and people like that. You know, when we think about those heroes of the Bible, we, we always associate who we are, our, our identities, with those heroes, right? We're always Moses, and we're never Pharaoh, right? We're always Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, never Neb- Nebuchadnezzar. We're always David, but never Goliath. We always want to see ourselves as kind of the hero in the story. But Jesus actually, in the same passage of scripture that we're going to be reading tonight towards the end of the passage of scripture, like reminds the religious people that they were doing the same thing, that they were looking at the the heroes of the Old Testament and going, wow, look at us. We are just like them. We're in the same line as them. We're, we're the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're the, the Moses. We're the Abrahams. We're people like that. But Jesus says this in, in Matthew 23, 29 through 39, 31, sorry. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors... We would not have taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. So what's that mean for us today? Well, clearly stated, it means this, that you know, if we're going to read the Bible, we need to read it from both accounts. We need, we need to be introspective and check ourselves and wonder, you know, could the same things be said about us today you know would we be persecuting people the same way that Saul was before he became Paul could could we be standing in the way of somebody coming to Jesus like the apostles were and and keeping the little kids from Jesus we, we've got to ask ourselves that instead of always making ourselves out to be the heroes of these stories so tonight we're going to be looking at a specific clap back that Jesus um, gives to the, the people, the religious leaders of his day. And, um, and it's specifically, he's going to be clapping back uh, at them because of their hypocrisy. And, um, you know, we've talked to him and reached out on campus before about the issue of hypocrisy and, and the damage that it does to our testimonies, the damage it does to our communities, and the damage it does to the church worldwide. And so we want to be really careful as we read these words again that we're being introspective to make sure that Jesus couldn't be saying the same things to us today. So before we get into Matthew 23 though, let's back up just a couple chapters and let's talk about what was going on that led up to this clapback. So what led up to the clapback was this, is that first Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a colt, the foal of a donkey, And as he rides in through the city gates, there are people standing around and they're shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And a lot of you guys will recognize that um, as what we celebrate today as Palm Sunday. And so there were these crowds of people who were shouting Hosanna, which literally means save or, or save us. And, you know, they were celebrating who Jesus was. Um, sadly, if you know anything about the history, you also know that those were the same people about a week later who were shouting crucify um, against Jesus. They were looking for Jesus to be a political savior to, to, li- to deliver the uh, people of Israel from the Roman occupation, not to be the savior who saved them from their sins, unfortunately. So, um, so that's what's going on. You know, Jesus is riding in and people are shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then Jesus heads to the temple where he chases out the money changers. If you know anything about Jesus and, and this story, you understand this is like one of the few times that we really get to see Jesus um, filled with righteous anger. And, and so he sees what um, he calls to be a den of thieves, that, that they've made you know, the temple into this place that God had never intended it for, to be, for it to be. And so Jesus drives out the money changers by fashioning a whip and, and turning over tables. He is furious uh, with what's going on in the temple. And so, as a result of him riding into the city and the people shouting Hosanna and him coming into the temple and driving out the money changers, the religious leaders of the day, I put down here, are big mad. Um, the, the word the Bible uses here is the word indignant. The religious leaders are indignant by Jesus' behavior um, over the past couple you know, hours and days. And so, this makes the religious leaders 
decide that they're going to set a trap for Jesus. And so four different times they try to trap Jesus in an argument. And so um, the first, they, they want to lure him in by asking him, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar. Now, uh, for us today, like, I guess we, we look at that and we go, well, that's not a big deal. You know, a lot of us, we even, you know, we have jobs and, and our employers take money out of our checks to give to the government to pay taxes. And so for us, the answer is like, well, no, I mean, it's not a big deal. But in Jesus's day, you know, giving to, to Caesar, you know, would, would have been to glorify him, would have also been, you know, the, this whole idea that, that they could have been using the same monies to help the poor and the broken and, and the people who were needy in society. And so they're trying to lay this trap for Jesus because either way that he answers, they're going to say, aha, see, we got you. See, if he answers and says, you know, know that it's okay to give money to Caesar, then they're going to argue that that money would be better spent in other places. Well, we could be giving that to the poor, the needy, the, the orphans, the widows. And, and so that's what they were going to lay the trap there. But if he says, no, it's not legal, then they're going to look to Rome and go, hey, look at this guy. He's stirring up all kind of trouble. He's telling people not to pay taxes. And so Jesus you know, asked them, he says, basically, whose image is on the coin? And someone says, well, it's Caesar's. And Jesus says, well, then render to Caesar, or give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to the Lord what is the Lord's. So he kind of silences them. So they're, they're not done yet. So then um, they decide to ask probably one of the most ridiculous questions, I think, in all of Scripture. And so they go to Jesus and they say, Jesus, so here's the situation. You know, this guy and this lady, they get married and uh, they don't have any children, but um, he passes away. And so um, his, his brother takes this lady now as wife, which was cultural because it was it would allow the woman to be taken care of in a, in a culture where women were not allowed to, um, you know, to provide for themselves or really to have many opportunities to provide for themselves. This was how they would care for the widows. Um, so so she says, so, he, so they said, all right, so this woman, she was married and her husband dies. So the brother takes her as a wife. That brother dies, and then the next brother takes his wife. And so this happens seven different times. So then they ask him, so then Jesus, then whose bride is she to be at the resurrection? Kind of a dumb question, right? And so Jesus is like, we're not given to be married uh, or to marry in the kingdom of God. You know, that, that you know, ultimately that we, you know, that's a non-issue, right? You know, why are you asking me this question? Why are you bugging me with this? And so he kind of shuts them down again. So then they're still not done. Still two more questions. First they go, all right, well, Jesus, you know, so there, there's, no, there's another discussion going on um, where they were asking Jesus what the greatest commandment in the law was. Now, the interesting thing about that is this, is that this was actually an argument that the Pharisees held a lot. You know, of all the countless laws in the Old Testament, and I know a lot of times as, as modern day Christians, we think of the law, we think of the Ten Commandments. And those were ten of many, many hundreds of laws. Um, everything from how you were to observe the Sabbath, to how you were to repay debts, what food was clean, what food was unclean, you know, how the temple was to be set up, all those, there's all these laws that they were to observe. And so they're asking Jesus, hey, basically Jesus, which one of these is more important than all of the rest of them? And so you guys will probably remember the story, but Jesus says, you know, that the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, you know, to love your neighbor as yourself. And he says this, he says, you know, as a result, all of the other laws of the prophets hang on those two. And so it's very, very profound, very, very wise in one way, because you know, we understand that you know, if we do those things well, if we love God and we love others well, that all the other things that we, we fight and st struggle over, they kind of fall in line. And so that's what Jesus is saying. So it's profound in that way, but it's also so simple in another. So um, a lot of you guys maybe have heard me teach before on um, this, the prayer that the Jews uh, prayed called the Shema. And so um, in the Shema, you know, that it, it starts off by saying... Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. That you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So Jesus is going back to very, very basics. This would have been the very first 
prayer that as an Israelite student, as a, as a Hebrew student, you would have learned this prayer. Not only would you have learned it, but you would have said it multiple times throughout the day when you woke up, when you headed out of the house, like when, before you went to bed at night, you would have said this prayer. And so he's, guy, he's saying, guys, this is so elementary. How did you miss this? So, so even these things so far are kind of a little clap back. And then there's the last one where they ask Jesus, whose son the Messiah is? Who, who is the Messiah, whose son is he? And so Jesus has a conversation with them about, you know, you know they say, are you David's son? And so Jesus points them back to scripture where um, David refers to the Messiah as Lord and not the son. And so that was, again, that was controversial. And so Jesus kind of, you know, he answers them, but he's kind of also kind of clapping back at them, but the real big clap back is here to come. So Jesus is, is kind of ready to put them in their place. And so that's exactly what we see here. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew 23, and we're going to be reading verses 13 through 15, and then 23 through 28. And it says this, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Wow, there you go, starting right out of the gate with a big clap back. He's called them hypocrites. He says, you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter. Yet will you let those enter who are trying to? Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, and your cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and, and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So you can see, Jesus is not holding back any punches. He's not, he's not pulling his punches here. He's laying into the Pharisees. He's clapping back at them for their, what? Hypocrisy. And so, you know, as we read this, you know, our, our, again, our, our, our reaction is, get him, Jesus. Tell him off. Tell him how it is. And we're always looking at those Pharisees like, you know, we don't want to be called Pharisees today, right? When you hear that, you're like, whoa, that's offensive. Don't call me a Pharisee. Why? Because we know that it has a negative connotation today. But in Jesus's day, a Pharisee would have been a very well respected religious person. And so, you know, we, we kind of shy away from being called that today. But in Jesus's day, actually, that was a very respectable title. But Jesus isn't pulling any punches here. He's laying in them and he's calling out their hypocrisy. So, you know, as we read this, let's try to be a little self-reflective and check ourselves and ask ourselves the questions. Do any of those descriptions apply to us? So let's talk about that. What do we learn from Jesus in this passage? The first is this. If we don't address and acknowledge our own shortcomings, our hypocrisy is literally slamming the doors of the kingdom in the faces of those who need it most. And so, you know, a lot of you guys, you know, I'm sure this is probably not going to come in as any surprise to you. If you've ever talked to somebody who's walked away from their faith or walked away from the church, um, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, the people that I talk to walk away, not because they have a problem with Jesus. I've never heard anybody say, well, like, you know, Jesus, I really just, his teachings, you know, they, they, they rub me the wrong way. He just doesn't seem like, you know, uh, a good guy. Why would he say those things? I, I've never heard anyone say that, you know, but what I have heard people say is similar things about the people that claim to be followers of Christ. So they'll say those things like, well, I was a part of a church, but this person reached out and they, they purposefully hurt me in a way that didn't seem a whole lot like 
Jesus. Or these people treated me in a way that I wouldn't have treated my own worst enemy, and yet they claim the name of Jesus. So we have to be really, really careful with our own actions and our own words because a lot of times what we may be doing is slamming the doors shut in the face of the people who need Jesus the most, the, the hurting and the broken and the marginalized society. Maybe they're looking at us, the things that we tweet, the things that we share on Facebook, the things that we say, you know, and, and they go, wow, like if that's what Jesus is about, I, I don't want anything to do with that. But the problem is, and, and some of you guys will understand this too, that a lot of times the people who take the name of Jesus and Jesus himself, uh, they don't actually have a whole lot to do with each other, right? That, that the people who claim the name of Jesus is what I mean by this. The people who claim the name of Jesus don't actually a lot of times act like Jesus. And, and I have to admit, sometimes that's true of me. Sometimes my anger gets the better of me. Sometimes like I just want to elevate myself while putting others down. Sometimes somebody's lashed out at me and, and I feel like they deserve to be brought down a peg or two. And so I lash back out at them. But I have to ask myself the question, is that somebody that Jesus loves and cares about? And if so, you know, why am I trying to tear them down as well? So we need to be careful that we're not slamming the doors shut in the face of the people that need it the most, that need to come into the church, that need to know the kingdom of God, that need to meet Jesus, you know, are, is our own actions and behaviors closing the door in their faces. And so we've got to be constantly introspective and looking for areas of our own sin. And, and you know, if I had to be, uh, I guess, stand up for the Pharisees here in a second, for a second, and say, you know, do I feel like that they were just horrible, terrible people? Um, no, I, I don't think they were. I think that they were trying their best to be holy, to be set apart. But the problem is they had become blind to the sin in their own lives. And so, you know, one of my favorite uh, prayers actually comes from Psalm, and it's, it's from David. David was very, very aware, if you've ever read his story, King David, um, very, very aware of his own sins and his own shortcomings. And so David prays this prayer, though, that, that I feel like is a prayer that we all need to pray, that is a prayer that we need to pray constantly because we have the same capacity as the Pharisees to become blind to sin in our own lives and therefore become hypocritical and therefore shut the door to the kingdom in the face of those who need it the most. And so David prays this. He says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. When is the last time you invited God to search you and to reveal hidden sin in your life? Like, I'll be honest, like, it's a difficult prayer because a lot of times God will pop up and he'll point that out to you when you least want to hear it. But I also believe that if we really genuinely care for other people and we, we don't want to be hypocrites, and, and let's be honest, we, we are a little hypocritical at times. Like, not, I'm not free of that either. But as we pray this prayer, as we invite God to search us and identify that sin, it gives us the opportunity to be authentic about that sin. To say, hey, look, this is what I'm struggling with. This is where I've fallen short. This is where I need Jesus and his grace. So would you consider, for the sake of the kingdom, praying that prayer so that others might not be hindered from Jesus because of your own hypocrisy and my own hypocrisy. So let's consider, let's pray that. The second thing that I want to see that we learn from Jesus is this, is that the practice of our religion is meaningless if we aren't also practicing love and mercy. So did you catch that part where Jesus says, look, you, you do all the outward things right. You know, you, you give a tenth of your spices and, and, and you, know, you, you appear religiously proper, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law. And he says that, you know, that he's talking about things like righteousness and mercy. And it kind of reminds me of, of Micah 6, 8. So you guys might be familiar with this passage. It says this, he has shown you, talking about God, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? So, so catch, catch this. This kind of is one of those things, again, that sums up what our response to God is to be. It says this, what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so, you know, in the age of social media, as I see so many people, Christians included, 
lashing out and tearing each other down. And, and a lot of times doing so in the name of wanting to be right. I, I, I want to be right because I believe this is true. And, and sometimes like we've even used scripture as a weapon against the hurting. And, and so like here's the thing. Like, we've talked in here before about you know, how scripture is to convict that, that it's to change our hearts, it's change our minds. And yeah, there's times as we read scripture, it should get all up in our business. It should make us uncomfortable. But never in scripture are we called to take the word of God and beat someone who is already down with it. And so we need to be careful that in our desire to be more right than the person that we read on Twitter or, or Facebook, that we're not neglecting the more important matters of the law um, of, of mercy and justice and walking how humbly with God so again you know outwardly maybe we're just like the Pharisees we look like we've got it all together we look like we have all the right answers because you know on you know on the, our highlight reels on social media and like Facebook and Twitter people see like oh look at them they went on a mission trip or they're in a Bible study or or they're taking pictures of their personal devotion time with God there's nothing wrong with any of those things we love all of those things but you know, if we're putting that out and shoving that down people's faces while neglecting to show them love and mercy and, and, and taking a big dose of humility while we're at it, then we're really missing out on what God has called us to do. And we could very well have been listening you know, among the Pharisees as Jesus spoke those words to us as well. And so lastly is this. What do we learn from Jesus? The third thing is this, that our primary concern should be to win people to Christ, not to win people to our own opinions, our own traditions, our own ideologies. And so, you know, as Jesus talks about, you know, how the, uh, the Pharisees would go over land and sea to, to win a single convert, and he says, and in doing so, you make them twice the child of hell as you are. We have to be really careful in the same way that as we produce disciples, that we're producing disciples who are following Jesus, or at least following us as we follow Jesus. The Pharisees just basically made people who were, who were following their same traditions, their same ways of life, and sometimes those things actually didn't line up with what God wanted for his people. But the Pharisees were so intent on convincing these people to follow in their ways that they neglected to point them to follow the best way, which is the way that God had laid out for us. Um, one of my favorite passages uh, of scripture is, is from the Apostle Paul. It's in 1 Corinthians 11. It's just a really, really short passage of scripture. And he says this, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So you notice like Paul's not saying, hey, follow me. But he's saying, follow me as I follow Christ. And that's an important distinction to make. And, you know, I've said before in our teachings, you know, that hopefully if something were to ever happen to me, whether, you know, like I left uh, to take a different job or like was no longer in this position, that you guys who are a part of this ministry now, you know, that you wouldn't just give up on it or quit following Jesus because, well, Dodger's gone. Hopefully you understand, like, you're not following me. If anything, you're following me as I follow Jesus. I'll be honest, a lot of times, guys, I look at you and I think, I want to follow Jesus like Blaine follows Jesus. I want to follow Jesus like Luke follows Jesus. I want to follow Jesus like Annie follows Jesus. You know, that, that I'm looking to your example as well. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as I understand who ultimately I'm following. That I'm not following Luke or Annie or Blaine. I'm following Jesus, but I just want to follow Jesus like those people follow him. There's nothing wrong with that. So we've got to be really, really careful you know, as, as we, uh, over the next couple of weeks, look at these clapbacks that we, again, consider how this may also be applicable to us. To be careful of the ways that we're interacting with the world around us and, and we're inviting people to come in and to be a part of this eternal kingdom. You know, that is, are we doing so and, and actually inviting them to be a part of Christ's kingdom? Are we inviting them to be a part of our traditions or ideas? Are we inviting people only to shut the door in their face when they realize that we're fake and we're phony, that we're not authentic about our own struggles, our own trials? Or, you know, like, are we actually real with them and say, guys, I, I don't have it together, but there's this amazing thing about Jesus that he doles out grace for us unconditionally and I'm still a recipient of that grace and I'm still learning I'm still growing can you help hold me accountable to that 
you know, and then, you know, lastly, as we think about that, you know, are we practicing the type of religion that, that God calls us to, you know, to walk humbly, to love justice and mercy? Or are we just going through the motions like the Pharisees were doing for the sake of looking good, for the sake of the highlight reel? Or are we really, are our hearts really content and set upon what God wants for our lives? Guys, I hope that this has been encouraged with you guys. I hope that that encourages you to consider the ways that you're living this week. Let me pray for you, and uh, we'll let you guys roll on out of here. So let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for this day that you've given us to get together. We thank you for your word and that, um, that it's laid out before us in such a way that, that we can learn about you and also, God, that we can also learn about ourselves. We can learn about human nature. We can learn about our strengths and our weaknesses. And God, we recognize that there are some holes in our armor, that, that none of us stand up perfectly uh, without flaw, without blame, without blemish. God, help us to not present ourselves to other people in that way either, that other people would assume that we've got it all together, that we're perfect, and then later sense that we're actually just hypocrites um, like so many others that they've encountered. But Father, allow us to be authentic. Allow us to be welcoming and loving, to, to, to seek your justice and, and your mercy, to, to elevate the cause of the broken and the marginalized in society, and that God, ultimately, that as we welcome people in and win people to um, this new way of life, that, that we're winning them to Jesus, not to our traditions, not to our ideas or anything like that, but that we're winning them to a relationship, a genuine walk with your son, Jesus Christ. God be with us this week, encourage us, and guide us and protect us. And we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks so much, guys. It's been a pleasure sharing with you guys. Hope you were encouraged. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week. Have an awesome day.